Well, hello, coffee culture. Um, I won the lottery. I got Jeremy Falk here with me today. And if you recall in a previous episode, I had found him accidentally looking for a meditation on Amazon Audible and found one called, conveniently, Coffee Lovers. And I'm a huge coffee lover, as we know, and it's what season five is for this show is talking a little bit about the brew, but more importantly about connection and the meetup. But I wanted so badly to have him on the show. Um, I'm, I might have kind of stalked him a little bit to get him here. I mean, he's here. So um, I'd like to start uh, with introducing him. Hello, Jeremy. Hey, Holly. So nice to be here. Thank you. And he has a wonderful bio that I will read, but we will learn a little bit more. We're going to dive a little more deeply. But what I did learn from him is that Jeremy Falk is an experiential facilitator that embodies 16 years of training in movement sciences, meditation, and positive psychology. He began his foundational yoga and meditation studies while living in an ashram in India and completed advanced training with world-renowned teachers, Jason Crandall, Stephanie Snyder, and Janet Stone. His meditation channel is one of the most popular on Audible, and he's been recognized as an ambassador for Lululemon, Fitbit, Yoga Journal, and as the head of yoga for Tempo Interactive Fitness. He loves inviting people into deeper and more authentic connections through international yoga retreats, wellness workshops, and men's circles. So hello, Jeremy. <laughs> We're ready right to dig in. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Holly. Thanks this is, for having me. This is really amazing. Um, I have so many questions. Um, and and so I think I'm gonna start with um maybe I'm gonna start backwards. Um you try to create authentic connections and create an atmosphere in your immersive retreats. And um, I do something similar. So I would love to talk about that. Like what brought you at the height of your career to start uh, building out retreats and specifically for men? Hmm. Well, I've always just loved, um, you know, I'm an extroverted kind of person and I love gathering with people. And I really, I really just love um, getting to explore authentic connections I think you know we spend a lot of time on the surface level in the real world and that's no secret and we pass people casually on the street and even those that we work with and see often we never get really much of a chance to figure out who are these human beings around us and I think that there's so much um, growth and understanding uh, that happens when we take time to relate but it's not easy for everyone you know sometimes uh, there, a little framework is helpful um, to get people to drop in. Not everyone has a natural inclination um, to lean into other humans, but, um, you know, and I'm I'm going to go deep right here off the bat. I love but it. I think the crux of it is <laughs> I really, um, I really believe in this idea that the, the root of, of all evil is the illusion of separation. And so this feeling that we are different and separate from other people um, is really like what is like the underpinning for what allows people to cause harm um, to each other, whether it's personal, relational, business, corporate, um, ecological, you know, so much of destruction um, comes from, you know, people not really being able to feel what they're hurting because they think it's, you know, something outside of them or they're not connected to it. Um, and, and so that's a huge motivation for me to want to bring people together to help us, um, all just remember and feel the shared and collective humanity that we have. Um, because I, I think it's not only supportive, um, to systems that, um, can operate in greater harmony, uh, for people and planet. Um, but it's also just fun and interesting. It's kind of the spice of life, um, to get to know people. So, um, that's a big and, and you know, deep philosophical answer, but, um, you know, as a yoga teacher and wellness, um, experiential lead, uh, of course it's a natural thing. Why not get people together? Um, you know, travel is another one of my favorite things as it is for a lot of people to explore new places in the world. So yeah, it's a, it's an easy win to combine those things and go explore new places and bring rad people together and, and have a chance to authentically relate and, um, and drop in. Um, the other part of your question was around men's circles. Um, and so I guess backing up about five years ago, I was introduced to 
um, a, a men's workshop. Uh, it was actually a three month sort of online circle. And it was the first time that I had been really introduced to something like that. My partner, um, girlfriend at the time, same partner, now wife, um, was like, I think you might like this. I think you might like this dude. And um, credit and, uh, and, and props to my teacher. His name is Shens Hartwell. And uh, he's an incredible relational coach. He works with couples and he, and he does men's work. And, you know, for anyone not familiar, what is this men's work or this term? Um, it's really an opportunity to help um, I think men specifically drop some of the hyper competition that we experience in the world, which feeds back to sort of a little bit of the um, destructive nature that we see when we are trying to just one up people and we don't realize we're actually connected to them. Um, to drop a little bit of the hyper connectedness and realize that we're actually stronger when we power through people and 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 um, meet each other at our strengths and sort of rise up together than we are when we just try to power over people. And this is the paradigm that the planet has been off operating in for so long is I, I need to acquire more power and resource than you and that person's going to try to acquire more power and resource than me and da 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 da. And so it goes. Um, so men's circles can be a lot of things, but I see it as a place for us to drop some of our competitive nature um, and also to learn how to, to feel and share, which is another part of uh, masculinity that has been trained to be closed off. And, you know, some, uh, some guys have never really had the chance to feel safe to even just express their feelings, depending on the environments that they were raised in. So this was transformative to me. And um, I always had good guy friends, but I, I also, through the first course that I did, realized um, that I really wasn't seeking like the medicine of um, male leaders or just even like healthy masculinity and healthy role models or other men that were operating in the world um, in a really connected, grounded, um, authentic place with integrity. We have so many role models or, you know, air quote role models um, through media, TV, movies, um, that is like the macho destructive character that's going to blow up <laughs> everything in its path to mm -hmm. um, to win it all. And and that's the modeling that we have. And we don't also we don't always get a lot of modeling of, um, you know, a man who can be in his strength, but also can be real authentic with his experience and emotion and, and be with other people without having to have um, a hyper competitive drive. And so I realized I was missing that and also didn't um, didn't always take the time to go deep with my friends. Sure, things would come up. We'd be there for each other. But most of the time you get together and it's kind of casual, playful. You go for a weekend getaway. You go to a bar. You go to a movie, whatever it is. And you're just kind of hanging out. Um, the men's circles provided a space to really explore that medicine and to go a little bit deeper um, so five years later I was working with him my, my teacher Shems and then started to co-facilitate um, some of the online programs and retreats that we were doing and really just in, enjoyed sort of being in that space and helping other guys feel comfortable with it too so to circle back to the um, you know to the original question that piece was another um, thing that just was bringing me a lot of joy and helping to increase uh, connectivity on the planet that is such an amazing answer. I I didn't expect you to go that deep right away, so I'm pretty happy about it. Um, you know, I have experienced so much uh, in terms of like the bro culture on LinkedIn, that um, hyper uh, competitive atmosphere. Um, I've also seen it a lot with women, a lot of mean girls and that, you know, they're lobbying to get that one spot, you know, that one seat at the table and then like pull down others. Um, and unfortunately you're right. I think, um, our media society, um, and definitely social media has, has, uh, pumped that up and, I love that you're finding, um, this is an overused word, an authentic way <laughs> to bring everybody together. I, I know a lot of people use that word, but I think these men's circles and these immersive, immersive retreats really allow people to go deep quickly and to like shed some of that macho bro culture, 
Um, and in the case of women, also competitive, um, I wouldn't call it bro culture, but it, it definitely has its similarities. I mean, there, I think women are, are, it's easier for women to open up to each other. I think instinctively women can do that more quickly than men can. So, um, but I'm really excited to hear that you're having success with that, that you're creating like a safe container where like these men can come together and learn how to have these deeper conversations. It, it must be like very uplifting for you to see it happen. Yeah, it's really a powerful experience and it's a paradigm shift. And when I got involved in that work about five years ago, um, I hadn't really heard of it before. You know, part of the reason that, that I um, got involved in it too is even a couple of years before that, what planted the original seed uh, is I was meeting with uh, a female friend to talk about some other projects. And she told me about um, a women's gathering that she was doing. And I was just so interested in it, you know, a women's circle and wanted to, you know, and it was a place for her women to come together and share the things that they're going through and hardships and to open up and relate. And it may feel really um, instinctive, you know, for women to do this. And it's probably been around a lot longer. You know, the beauty of it is, is that there, that is a natural inclination that often women can feel. Um, the sorrow in it is that part of the drive to get together outside the normal structure is because the normal structure has been um, so disempowering to women. And, and, and the world that we live in, right? So there, it's like this natural rebound where, where that causes a need to then circle up together to share so much of what's going on. I mean, there's an inherent need for people to do that. And then there's this extra societal push that has caused that. So it's like a beauty and a sorrow at, all wrapped up. And I just loved um, that it was happening. And so I asked my friend, I was like, wow, like, this is so great that you're circling up with your sisters. Like, what is a, you know, well-intentioned, open-hearted, conscious man like me? How can I like support that? How can I, you know, um, be in service to that? And she said, you don't need to be a part of our circles. You need to get the men together <laughs> and you need to get the men together and mm -hmm. work on building your house while we work on building our house. And then from that place, then we can come together and have a better village. And I was wow, like, that was very profound of her to, to state it that way. Wow. Totally. And so that was what initially planted the seed around men's work. And then a year or two later, whenever it was, um, when my partner shared this thing, I was like, okay, I'll check out what this three month online, you know, men's circle was about. And um, I've done several of them since then and many programs and realized uh, it is important. And then in the last five years, it's been quite the movement. There are many teachers, many organizations, uh, men's circles, men's groups are flourishing um, to a great degree. And I, I really hold that vision that I, I hope to see a men's, you know, circle or place um, on every corner for every type of dude. Um, because, you know, in almost any field, people are going to just be attracted to the teachers that they're attracted to. Uh, not every teacher is going to be able to relate or connect to every person and every student. And that's okay. We just need um, more diversity among teachers so that everyone feels like they have someone that they can relate to and connect to. And so that's, that is my vision. Um, ultimately, um, on the planet. Well, it sounds like a something really great to look forward to. I think if you set the bar, you know, and and enough men come away feeling that they've um, elevated their experience on this planet, that they feel more human and more connected, um, it will grow. It'll grow organically. It'll grow fast, like a field of mushrooms. <laughs> it will yeah. grow. You know, yeah. I think. Uh, people are really seeking that. I, I see it more. I see more men now that are uh, rethinking how they approach life. Um, I think it's become a more open conversation for people. It's not, I, I think in the past, it would have uh, felt almost emasculating for some men like, oh, I can't do it men's circle what's that but i think right. people are becoming more open to different ways of growing and communicating um i, I don't know if you've seen that but i personally have seen that mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely so jeremy now let's go back in time to see like what young jeremy like how this transpired so your connection started in an ashram um 
at least that's how I read it, but maybe that's not how it started. So do you want to take us back a little, like how you landed in that space? Because that's a very tough thing to do, to go to India, to an ashram. That's not like you wake up, <laughs> you don't wake up one morning saying that's what you're going to do, right? Yeah. Um, my journey into yoga. Okay. That's the question. Yeah. That's like, how did essentially, I yeah. I mean, because you, space? you did meditation and then yeah. it was also positive psychology. So you yeah. ended up at an ashram. So I was wondering what that connection was that got you to go there. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Well, I, you know, in college, um, psychology was my, you know, my, my bachelor's degree. And that was just because I've always been fascinated, <clears throat> um, studying people and learning about people. So I, I spent a lot of time in psychology and sociology and philosophy just um, interested in people and social dynamics and the way the mind works and the way that we relate um, and you know often like some college students I, I also just didn't know what I wanted to do like with that I knew what I was fascinated to study so it was a natural degree for me um, but I didn't really want to be a research assistant in a lab I didn't really want to be a clinical psychologist and work with patients one-on-one -on -one, so I didn't really know what I wanted to do um, I just wanted to study people and after college, um, came home, was in a liminal space of like, all right, you know, I got like a quick um, uh, waiter job at a, a restaurant in Malibu from LA and was just going to kind of figure it out for a few months after college. And then I ended up popping into a gym um, in, my, in my neighborhood. And uh, I had always kind of thought about being a personal trainer because I was also a health nut and I loved working out. And um, I was always into lifting weights and running, which is a big part of my story because um, I had, had childhood asthma and um, a big part of uh, my childhood asthma, the doctors told my parents early on was to encourage me into sports, not to shy me away from sports, but encourage me into sports to help beat it. So I grew up, you know, playing soccer. Uh, I'd flag my mom and she'd throw my inhaler onto the field and I'd puff it and throw it back when I was in high school. I, I joined the cross country team and I had it tucked in my waistband and I would hit it and I would keep running. My and son so, did the same thing, by the way. This oh, is, this is yeah, uh, Go ahead. <laughs> Go yeah, ahead. totally. So, so that was a big part of it. And, um, you know, just being physical and into sports was a, a big part of my life. And then eventually the gym in high school and, and all that. So, um, I had thought about helping people, you know, be on that path and, and get healthy. So it turns out the, one of the managers of the gym was an old high school buddy of mine and said, yeah, get, get certified. I'll hire you. So there was. And so I started working as a personal trainer and did that for like six or seven years, um, in LA. And it was a great combination of um, getting to be involved in health and fitness and a little bit of that psychology, because you're, you're kind of there you are working one on one with people, helping them um, to overcome their own mental blockages, self esteem, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or just simply lending a listening ear for 60 minutes while you're moving around the gym and they're, <laughs> they're chatting about whatever there is on their mind in their life. Right. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of that. So it was this great intersection. And um, you know, I, I guess a piece to back up. So I was, you know, in college, I was also working out a lot. So before the personal training piece, um, it was a college roommate of mine that took me to my first yoga class. And he was telling me, he, he kept inviting me to yoga for months. Um, and I was like, no, bro, I'm going to go to the gym and run. Thank you. And <laughs> did that for a while and declined the invitation. And then one day I was like a little tired for the gym. So I was like, great, I'll do this yoga. I don't have that much energy. And so I went with him. It was a hot yoga class. And, and you got your ass whipped. <laughs> I got my ass whipped. Yeah, that was exactly it, Holly. I was, I remember vividly um, halfway through this class and there I was a muscle bound um, early 20 year old, uh, you know, just sweating profusely, dripping bullets and like shaking, falling over and dying for a sip of water. And all around me, I saw people of all ages and all body types that were cool and collected and composed in their practice. And I was this buff dude that was shaking and falling over and sweating like crazy. So I was extremely humbled and it opened the lens um, for me that there's so much more to wellness um, than, than I, had, I had thought just being in the gym and working out. So that was a precursor. So from that point, I would do yoga every now and then. I was like, all right, cool. I'll add this to my repertoire. And, and every now and then I still lifted weights, ran a lot, and I'd go to yoga once in a while. 
And, you know, after seven years or so of being a personal trainer, I started to realize how much more there was to holistic health. And I would meet people who are into holistic nutrition. And I learned for the first time about the healing power of foods and how um, how terrible the standard American diet really is and and um, and the stuff that we eat and think is food here. And uh, and so my mind was really opening. And the last piece that set me off on this journey was that I was working one on one with people of all decades of life. So I was, you know, this was probably between the age of 21 and 27 or eight. And I had clients in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, up into their 80s. I even worked um, at a Jewish home for the aging and worked with um, senior citizens in that way, too. And from every decade of life that was um, chatting with me all day, one of the constant messages I heard was go travel the world while you're young and free. (laughs) <laughs> before True. all the things that all tie you down all exactly. the stuff and I really um I heard this a lot from a lot of people and I um I really took it to heart so I was like cool I I want to know more about the wellness I was into eastern philosophies trying to step outside the western um mentality and and wanted to go have this wanderlust experience so I ended up saving up money for um a year and a half or something like that to go travel the world for a year and that was my goal And I gave up my apartment on Sunset Boulevard in Silver Lake. I was living in East LA at the time. My parents were graciously uh, willing to accept me. So I moved in with my folks just to save money and go have a backpacking trip um, and the adventure of a lifetime. So I did that and I went traveling for 12, about 12 months. I mean, I like to my last dollar and came home and I just made it. And um, it was during that time, I was like in Europe for four months and then I spent a lot of time in Asia and I landed in India and I knew I was like, yeah, maybe I'll study yoga. And I, you know, I wanted to study modalities here and there. Maybe I'll do a teacher training. So I landed in India. Um, it was the most transformative five months of my life. And I ended up doing my 200 hour teacher training in an ashram on the Ganga River in the, in the city or the town of Rishikesh uh, in the north of the foothills of the Himalayas. And that was, um, it just guided me there. There's, there's so many stories that this could be easily a four hour podcast of how I arrived <laughs> at that ashram and all the, all the things that nudged me on the way. But, you know, suffice to say really that, um, that place, uh, the, my experience in Rishikesh, uh, was such that it felt like the veil between the physical and the energetic realms was a lot thinner than it is in most places, meaning stuff that I would think or or want or things that would pop into my head would find these really interesting ways to just like show up on the street or at a cafe and um, and manifest. And it just felt like my participation with life and the ability to bring things from thought into presence um, was more powerful than it had been in a lot of places. Something was like magical about that place. So stuff like that brought me into that ashram and I did my 200 hour. And that was the first time We were doing yoga every day for 30 days and I was waking up at 5 a.m. to go to the ashram to do uh, an hour of uh, pranayama breath practice and then, you know, meditation and then we would move our bodies Um, and and then we'd have philosophy and more meditation and then asana again and that was the time, the first time that I really got the full or a more complete picture of yoga, uh, the scope outside, you know, the um, physical Western classes that we know. And it was life-changing. I remember walking around the town of Rishikesh feeling simultaneously the most grounded that I had ever been in my life. And also a little bit like I was levitating um, and just kind of like floating. I was like deeply grounded and also floating. And I was like, what is going on? Um, I I need to share this with people. It must've been hard to leave. I mean, it it was so powerful. Yeah, I had to drag my ass out of there because my visa was expiring and I didn't want any trouble. So I think I got out on a bus to Nepal just a few weeks after my visa expired and luckily it was okay. Wow. It it, it would be hard maybe to go back. Uh, have you gone back? I haven't yet. Um, I would love to. This was 10 years ago. Um, and like you said, it's not necessarily an easy place. And I do recommend having a fair amount of time. India is not a place to go visit for a week. Mm-hmm. Um, even two weeks is quick. Uh, but you know, worth it if you did, but do you, it's, do, um, do you think yeah. you could slide back into that, um, that magical space that you found there? Do you think maybe you're like even more evolved now that it might, might be stronger when you got there or are you afraid at all that 
you wouldn't be able to capture that lightning mm. in a bottle again. Mm. Mm. You know, I think if and when, I mean, not, not if, I, I will go back. When I go back, it will be with no expectations. Mm. Fair. Um, it will be Fair. very open and with no expectations because either one of those could be, but it is, um, it is a powerful place and it is like, um, it is like the world under a microscope. Um, everything is more intense there. Uh, the beauty um, of the world is heightened and the pain and suffering of the world is heightened and you will see it all one after the other um, on any casual walk on the street. And it, it kind of, um, especially for somebody that isn't raised there to visit, um, I think people have kind of two divergent experiences. Some people just can't handle the intensity and their head explodes and other people um, find this deep um, calm center inside themselves where they can um, move through the world, seeing both the beauty and the suffering and still stay connected to a place inside themselves that will allow them to then act um, and not just freak out. Mm. You know, it's not that you're, um, it's not that you're apathetic to what's going on. It's just that you need to be in a grounded place to know how to respond and not losing your shit. <laughs> so people will have those two kind of experiences. And I was, I was the latter. I, I had this deep calm center um, that developed inside of me. It's a lot there. I mean, there. I mean, I haven't been, but people I know have been there. Is all the senses are are heightened, right? Mm -hmm. It's 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 it probably requires you to really think about what you want out of a trip like that. I mean, you kind of knew going in, so I don't know what I'm trying to say here. I th I think it's just your senses are just all heightened. So you have to be prepared for that, right? Because that could like assault the body. So some people maybe have a negative reaction versus a positive one. I don't know. Totally. And I wasn't prepared. It was difficult when I first got there. New Delhi is a wild city. It is It is extremely populated. Um, it is a, it is, it can be a tough environment. And I had traveled a lot of places in the world and um, New Delhi still had brought an intensity um, that took me a few days to really adjust to. And then I got away to the Himalayas, um, you know, in the peaceful, quiet mountains and could then really um, drop into a new place too. Nice. I love this. Um, I'd like to, okay, so we, we've talked a little bit about your men's circles and kind of how it started, um, but there was a lot of stuff that was happening in between. And I don't know if maybe your work as a brand ambassador or with Amazon, with the or Audible collection, if that's sort of like in the middle, uh, maybe you can help me a little bit orient your career there so we can understand where it all landed and why. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, so after the world travels, um, and I, I did deplete my last dollar, I was like living in Cambodia on an <laughs> island. I was just like casually teaching yoga because I just finished the training. Um, and I realized I ran out of money and I called my best Surprise. friend. I called my best friend who bought me a flight home and I came back nice. at, um, at, at 28. Yeah. And um, at 28, I, LA then felt like a big messy city to me too. It just felt like a big sprawled out place. And I, I was craving something different. I had a few best friends in San Francisco that um, I had visited a handful of times and I really liked um, San Francisco. So I thought, okay, I'm about to start over at 28. I could do it anywhere. So I, I drove up to SF with my, my car packed full of stuff and pretty broke. Um, they were kind and gracious enough to uh, let me crash on their couch for several months and another buddy too. And it took me several months to get on my feet. And then I got on my feet and I was doing personal training and yoga and even Thai massage, which was another thing I studied on my travels in Thailand. Oh, and just so as an aside. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was another that was another part of the journey and, and got to do that because I was trying to study um, you know, different modalities where I could. So I had this, you know, that was my practice. I was this um, independent wellness entrepreneur. And, um, and then what I loved about San Francisco is that it's, you know, it's a much smaller uh, city, it is very dense, and the networking just seemed to really happen quickly. Um, and connections were made. And, um, you know, I had a friend who said, why don't you go check out Lululemon? They're usually plugged into the yoga scene. If that's something you want to do. So I ended up getting a job um, for, you know, just under a year working on the floor at Lululemon, 
Um, and that was, that was amazing. I got, you know, connected to studios and I ended up getting my first studio job. Um, and then when things were picking up for me, I, um, you know, I, I left the Lululemon job and I set the goal that I wanted to be an ambassador and be one of the folks on the walls that I was looking up to that were like big players and names, um, for fitness and wellness in their city and, um, started teaching at different studios, uh, started teaching in corporate offices. That was another thing that was happening, which is cool because the SF is really open to that. And a lot of these companies, especially these, um, you know, tech companies like to, at the, at the time before everyone was working from home, uh, obviously the movement was to make uh, office life as sweet and cushy as possible. So I picked up a lot of those, and and that was um, and that was a great, uh, you know, part of the part of the business too. So um, I was teaching um, at tech companies and studios and all of that, and eventually it just sort of collapsed into yoga. Um, I had a massage office for a year, but I didn't really want to stick with that. And I even just started to lose interest in the personal training. Uh, I really just became passionate about yoga and meditation and um, and the mindset that comes with that too, because it is ultimately a mindset. And I've been here for 10 years and, uh, you know, just sort of um, made my way with different connections and um, established a, a proficient sort of, um, I don't know, community here, I guess. Mm. It's so interesting, all the through lines, you know, you, you started in college with that one yoga class and here you are ending with it, even though you had all the other stuff in between. It's uh, interesting, the, hmm. the directions that you've gone, the, um, the audible piece. So mm -hmm. you do yoga on there and you do meditation, right? The audible, um, the classes on audible were actually just meditations okay. and that was another fitness startup that, um, I was connected with. That was the other thing, you know, the cool thing about San Francisco, all these, um, startups coming around and, and especially the ones in the wellness space will find local teachers, et cetera. So it got to be a part of some exciting projects. Uh, one of them was a project called move with, and they were doing, um, uh, audio classes. So it was a platform on your app where you could take hit or running or walking or yoga or meditation. Um, classes, uh, audio. So it was just the recording. You put your headphones onto your phone. And so I was recording a lot of content for them. And then ultimately they had a partnership with Audible um, to create meditation channels. So that content moved over to Audible and live there. And then that was probably the first time that I had um, content and stuff that I was offering that was then shared globally. And it became just one of the most incredible experiences because I have received so much incredible, positive heartwarming, touching feedback around the meditations that I offered there. You know, my, my, the, the, the style and the approach I like to take is really um, grounded and accessible. And, um, you know, not to speak with any like special voice where it feels like you're putting on a persona, but just to be super real and right. talk to people where they're at, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that lands and, the, you know, I'd receive messages all the time from people who would find me. And the cool thing is, is like Audible doesn't even have my website or Instagram linked. They would just, they'd take the time to search me on the internet and then somehow still find me. That's and, me. Yeah. I had, like <laughs> you, Holly, as of why I'm here right now. And, and it never ends. It's great. And, um, and then just send really kind messages around how, like, I never thought that I could meditate or I, I always just like, didn't like meditating. And then I found yours and I really appreciated it and this and that, and this and that. Um, I did some kids meditations and they're like, this has been life-changing for my kids. They're, they're, um, they're, they're more calm and, and they enjoy sitting down quiet time. It's, I have one called the magic carpet ride and, and just let the kids like visualize and have an imagination ride. And, um, and even, you know, even there was a message one time that a guy reached out with his sincere gratitude because he was in the hospital. His wife was dying of cancer and they were listening to my meditations in the hospital and it was helping them through the most difficult time in their life. And he was so grateful to me and found me and wrote me a message around that. And I was wow. like, holy shit. Yeah, you just, you just never... gave me goosebumps all the way up my back on that one. Yeah, and you just never know. There I was in a little booth in San Francisco recording you know, for this startup. And then somehow it reaches people across the world and changes their life. And I just am so grateful for that um, and got to have that experience. So that was, you know, it's been really, um, it's been really powerful for me. Move With is no longer, um, and that, that uh, you know, that um, contract or, or whatever has, has ended. 
Um, mm. But hey, you know, Audible, if you're listening, I got a great channel. Happy, <laughs> happy to make Ex- some more. You know, exactly, and, and exactly. It's, it's been a joy since then to create content for other places um, and share it with the world. It's it's usually pretty well received, and I'm really grateful for that. I love it. I and the connections that you made with people, you didn't even realize how you were connecting with them on that level. It's really beautiful. Mm-hmm. I I just love. So I love podcasting. I've been doing it now for three years. Um, it was not a part of my life before. Um, but the nuance of voice, there's I don't even have to look at a screen. Like I love actually your meditations where I can just close my eyes and and be in the moment, like just hearing your voice, any voice, but your voice is really wonderful, by the way. And mm. I just the nuance. Um, I I think that. Um, I don't know about you, but I think we're so overwhelmed with video and short video and short form and words and colors and filters and things happening like our we're we're almost bombarded all the time. And it's so interesting when you close your eyes and go into a meditation where all you're focused on is this person's voice it's a different kind of connection. Like I really felt connected. That's why I wanted you to come on. Like I really felt that. And um, it's what we're all seeking, right? Is some connection. Yeah. For yeah. sure. So, thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah. And and on that note, I fell in love with the coffee lovers meditation, which I said at the top of this. And the reason why I fell in love with it, which by the way, for anybody out there who hasn't really started a meditation practice or has a disjointed one like I do, um, it is so accessible to be able to look at meditation as, okay, it doesn't have to be that I'm sitting on the couch and I have my, you know, ring finger and, and thumb here and someone has this fun, funny voice going and the sound and the bowls, they're hitting the bowls and it doesn't have to be that. I mean, literally, and Jeremy's going to do this with us next, he had me meditating over my cup of coffee. So at some points in time, my eyes were open. Sometimes they were closed. I was sitting and I was holding this cup of coffee and like, it felt real. Like, Hey, I can meditate in a variety of ways. It does not have to be that I'm sitting quietly on a chair and life isn't quiet around me all the time. So it felt like more accessible, your meditations. And and I liked that. So People should check that out, by the way. Thank you. Would you like to do a coffee meditation with my coffee lovers here? Of course. I would love to. Absolutely. All right. All right. Well, I, I brought my requisite cup. Mm. Yep. I got mine here too. Excellent. Look how we planned that, Jerry. Uh, it's, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> <laughs> if I was smarter, my logo would be on here. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> No judgment. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I'm going well, to pass you. Um, I'm going to pass the mic to you, my friend. Cool. You know, I think the um the the impetus for this kind of meditation, it's really, you know, it's mindfulness. Mindfulness and meditation have a lot of overlap. Um it's just allowing us to take a pause and to be more present with our experience in life. And yeah, I don't believe that we all all have the time and space to um sit down in a quiet um, place um, for long periods of time it's great when you do but we gotta also just meet people where they're at and and we're, most of us are busy running around and so the little spaces where we can take a pause um, a breath and drop out of necessarily the mind and, and into all of the senses um, is a really great way to introduce the practice into your life and of course naturally I love coffee um, always have huge fan uh, um, I don't know if we'll get to that journey you know also but um, it is one of my favorite things. And so again, we'll ask you that just... at the end. We'll go to that. Sure. Again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And why not, um, you know, just why not take the time to really enjoy? Because I think, I think part of um, our modern culture is uh, rush, 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 get on the next thing, get on the next thing, next thing, next thing, next thing, what's next. And we don't often um, stop to sip and savor the moment um pun intended you saw where i'm going with that <laughs> so it works you know, it's, it's 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 um it's really important just to just to slow down because otherwise like what's the point where are we going we get to the end of the day or the end of a life and all we were doing was just rushing forward um and so it's you know if if we're doing anything meaningful then that meaningful 
stuff that we're doing deserves to be um, savored once in a while as well. So I guess that's a little um, background to to the coffee meditation. And just like uh, a lot of meditations I try to offer, it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be complicated. And it doesn't right. have to take a lot of time. So. Right, right. Yeah, and I think the other little piece I'd add about that is we're drawn to rituals. We're naturally yes. drawn to them. And if having a cup of coffee is one of your rituals, you can find a mindful practice with it, like I did with Jeremy, mm-hmm. with with this meditation. And again, it's it's about accessibility. It's about bringing those moments into your life where you can stop, even if it's for five minutes, three minutes, you've still achieved something, right? Like that yeah. you still achieved that goal of mindfulness. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. So if you're out there and you're at home, and you want to hit pause and grab a cup of coffee or something. And to, to be honest, this can be done with any drink. It really can. It can be a great hot drink meditation. So if, if you're not, I mean, I assume you're listening to this podcast, you're into coffee, but of course you can do this with any hot drink. Um, you know, dare I say the T word, you can also have some tea <laughs> and um, anything, and, you know, and if no shaming pot, here. Yeah, no <laughs> shame. It's all good. I mean, coffee is the superior drink, but you can also have your, <laughs> I do. I liked you, Jerry. I was going to tell it like it is exactly. um, my, just, you know, my, my wife's on the way other end of the spectrum she's hardcore tea um and we we go at this all the time but we've gotten each other to really appreciate um the other and that's also what she loved about this too is because tea is a meditation for her Mm -hmm. um tea you know and it often is served that way um so you know bringing this into coffee um is is sort of bringing um merging those worlds together because tea has a rich history with meditation and, and ritual that way um, so get your cup of coffee and if you're driving, you can just imagine, uh, you know, imagine what it would be like. So we're just going to simply hold our cup and we're not going to drink for a, a moment or two and and we'll just place the cup in the palm of your hands and you can soften or close your eyes if that works for where you're at. And we'll just start with a big breath in and a big breath out. I think it's really good to begin any practice that way. So maybe one more time, just a big breath in. And a big breath out. And even one or two of those will allow time to kind of slow down a little bit. So then we'll simply feel the hot mug that's in our hands. And just bringing attention to the sensation of warmth that it's giving in the hands feeling and noticing how this hot drink is transferring heat energy into the mug and transferring that heat energy into your hands. And just taking a moment to be with the soothing feeling of the warmth. And maybe even connecting to the idea that These particles, when heated up, are bouncing around more rapidly and quickly and moving, even though it may feel like your cup and coffee are still, the heat that's present implies that there is incredible movement at the subatomic level that is bouncing around the coffee, bouncing into your mug, and bouncing into your hands, and then slowly even perhaps heating your body up and taking a moment just to be with the miracle of physics in that way. And then you can bring the cup a little closer to your nose and just take a nice little whiff. And take in the aroma of the coffee and just notice any notes that you may taste and smell through the nose. And and then the sensation that that gives you because smell is so firmly tied to memory and... It's one of those things that um, just brings us deeply into an experience. You know, you may smell coffee when you're doing something else and it kind of maybe brings the uh, endorphin or dopamine rush to you. And here we are right now with one of our favorite things. So just taking a moment to notice any notes, the profile, does it smell smoky or chocolatey or earthy or whatever you got going on? If it's a tea, is it herbal and what herbs? And then from there, we'll go slowly and we'll start to just take the first sip. And before we even swallow, just for a moment, just allow it to really rest on your palate. 
and I'm going to keep talking, so you go for it. But while it's on your palate, just take a moment. You don't have to swish, but just feel how that energy transfer, flavor transfer is actually happening in the mouth, and then swallow and take it down. And as you swallow, just notice that the heat and the energy and the warmth and how soothing, soothing it is as it goes down into the belly and warms you up from the inside out. And now you've ingested this, this incredible drink that has been around for so long on the planet, the most popular, one of the most popular for good reason. And you can enjoy just a sip or two at your own pace. You know, not just chugging it, but feeling the warmth, noticing the flavor profile in the mouth. You can get creative and start to just name, you know, notes that you may taste and feel the sensation as it warms the body and goes in. And of course, with any meditation or moment of mindfulness, you're also breathing, which is bringing more richness into the present moment. And after a few sips and a few moments, you may start to get that first tingle or kick of the caffeine and the energy that's present in this drink. And even if you're not drinking a caffeinated drink, you may feel the energy of the plants or the tea that you're taking in, whatever direction that is. Maybe it's calming for you or maybe it's bringing more alertness. And so just taking a moment to tune in and feel the subtle shift of your energy, whether it's going up into a place of alertness, a beautiful sensation of waking up with coffee, or if the herbs are relaxing and you're going in another direction, and how are they interacting with your body? And can we actually tune into the moment that we feel the shift? So we'll give just a moment for you and anyone out there to enjoy one or two more sips with the whole experience, feeling warmth in the hands, the smell, the taste, the way it goes into the body, warming the body, and any shift or sensation of energy you feel. And if any of it is remotely pleasant or pleasurable, Turn up the volume and let yourself be with the pleasant or pleasurable experience. And finally, just ending with a moment of gratitude for the full life cycle of this bean or this plant or this herb that has made it into your body in just a moment of gratitude for the earth and from wherever it came from, the hands that cultivated it, that grew it, that cropped it, and for the people that helped then to process it and bring it into our mug and the many, many hands and lives and hearts that brought this delicious and beautiful beverage from the earth and into our hands and a moment of gratitude for that whole cycle. And we'll take a big breath in, then a big breath out. Thanks for making time to meditate today. That was beautiful. I loved that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cool. so relaxed now. <laughs> uh, good. Nice balance, maybe, of relaxation and caffeination when it happens. That's good, too. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's perfect. Thank you. Thank you My for pleasure. that. Yeah. I liked the gratitude at the end. I don't think I recall that from the the one that you did before that I did mm -hmm. before. I like that. Yeah. Um. So, 
Jeremy, I, I, I love that you love coffee as much as I do, because I consider myself a co an unapologetic coffee snob. Yes. Tell me, um, because it brings us into some of the mindfulness, uh, the experience and the sense of smell, um, when did you have your first sip? Gosh. Well, you know, um, I can't pin it to a moment, to be honest. Um, I think my coffee, my love of coffee grew at some point later. But, you know, I waited a while. You know, my parents were, you know, they don't drink that stuff. It'll stunt your growth. And <laughs> it didn't have any for a long time. And I think it finally maybe, you know, towards the end of high school, it was a little more acceptable and then by the time in college, like most college kids, I was doing anything I could to stay awake and alert and make it through the roller coaster of that ride. So I was drinking a lot of coffee. But for most of, um, you know, and I just I really appreciate it. But for most of my, um, you know, since that college life drinking coffee, um, I was also a heavy cream and sugar uh, user. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I just liked the sweetness and the creaminess. And so it's like having ice not, cream. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, because, you know, we're all really, most of us conditioned to, um, to sugar and to crave that. And without realizing it, yeah, I was definitely drawn to, um, I was a heavy cream and sugar person in my coffee. And I didn't like the black coffee, um, just thought it was bitter and didn't really do it for me. So for years and years and years, um, and I try and I would go all over the place and try all the different creamers and then eventually plant-based creamers and alternative sugars and was, you know, t making slightly healthier choices in that aspect. Um, but just did a, a lot. And then at some point, you know, in my San Francisco years, I got really into blended coffee and the bulletproof came out. Um, yes. and it was into I was like, big. I was a big fan of yeah, that. And, yeah. And me too. And, and still love it. But then it was like, I mean, Bulletproof was like the gateway to blending your coffee. And then all of a sudden I was like, you know, then came the mushroom powders and this supplement and that supplement yes. and this and that. And I was like, why not get it all in, in this drink? And then, <laughs> and then, I, you know, I did that for years too. And I was constantly playing with new, you know, powders and supplements to make this supercharged, um, you know, coffee drink in the morning and love that for years. And then at some point I was like, dude, you spend 30 minutes at the counter in the morning, like preparing this drink uh, and then cleaning it up and putting everything away. And you're spending a ton of money on all these things too. And it just started to feel a little excessive <laughs> at some point that I was just having to do this entire 20 the Vitamix, step process. right? The yeah, Vitamix. and blend my coffee. Yeah, exactly. And um, <laughs> with you know, the collagen and like, powder and the butter and right. the, yeah, the all whole thing. It, yeah, the know? MCT and, oil. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it got to be a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, um, and so I did that. And then it was also like, wait, hold on. We know, love you, David Asprey, but still no, okay. <laughs> no, totally grateful for it. And so we'll come full circle. Cause I'm actually, I'm doing a little bit of that again, Oh, but okay. For a long, right. but yeah. for, you know, and, and I do love it. I actually love it again, but for a while it was just too much because I was adding in too many things. And then it was like, I couldn't, you know, if I'd go travel, um, it's not easy to travel with that stuff. So I was either stressed out bringing a bunch of supplements um, or, you know, or I just wasn't enjoying coffee where I was cause I it wasn't, you know, my coffee smoothie or whatever. So at some point, um, and this was probably maybe You'd like, like over engineered the love. Yeah. 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 It just got a little ridiculous. Yeah. And, um, and then I, I made a switch and I tend to do this in my life too. Cause I can do one eighties and go from zero to 60 and like, I'll just go, I don't like tiptoe into things. I go like pretty hard Same and heavy. Here. Like, why not? Yeah. And um, I, uh, I found a company called Onyx, uh, shout out to Onyx, their roastery in, I think, um, I think Kansas, forgive me if I'm wrong. I think that's where they're based. Um, maybe Kentucky. Whoops. Sorry. And um, it's one of those. And uh, I think Kansas and they're a roastery and they source some of the best coffees in the world that I've ever tasted. And that's kind of how they market themselves. And they, of course they have great marketing too. And so eventually it got me to try some of their coffee and it's, you know, it's not cheap. It was more expensive coffee. And I was usually just buying whatever coffee, you know, I would get from, you know, I wasn't necessarily buying um, great brands uh, and, and so I started trying the Onyx and then I was like, well, I just spent all this money on coffee. So maybe I should just like taste it and not adulterate it with all the 30 things that I was doing. So then all of a sudden I just kind of like started drinking black coffee and 
um, you know, the first few tips was like, sips were like, okay, this is interesting. And then I just really grew to love it again. And I went hardcore in the other um, realm of everything. And I just was drinking only black coffee. And I really, so I got on their um, Roaster's Choice subscription and I would get a two pound bag sent to me every month, uh, their choice. And I never knew what it was. And it was always delicious. Hmm. And they have the tasting notes on there and they have great brew guides um, to go on and learn how to brew it. And I do mostly pour overs. And uh, I just really started to get into the flavors and the tasting notes and the profiles of coffee for the first time. And, and that's when I really was like, this is it, black coffee, you don't need anything else. And I went hardcore into the other realm. And that's what I've been doing for the last, you know, pretty close to two years, and just loving it. And it changed, it changed um, my coffee drinking. And now I go out to like a casual restaurant, and I get a regular cup of Joe, and I'm like, mm, this is not good coffee. It's like most places you go. Now I'm like hyper aware that it's just really not good coffee brewed well um i can't you know i used to do the you know the big chain we all know who they are and i can't do them anymore mm -hmm. um at all and so it kind of made me a little bit of a coffee snob and so now you know i have this and um i've really really appreciated uh, my journey with onyx and getting onto that roaster's choice that is so, really cool yeah i'm gonna have to try that and so here's the kicker the best part too uh, my my tea drinking my tea loving wife who um, used to have a sticker on her mug from actually a, a mushroom coffee alternative brand. Uh, their slogan was fuck your coffee. And so she had, cause they were okay. making an alternative mushroom coffee. Mm -hmm. um, she had that sticker on her mug. So that's where the corner she was in was like, fuck your coffee. And I'm like drinking black coffee. Like, don't give me anything else. Fuck your tea. And, <laughs> then, and I was like, babe, you really got to try this coffee. It's actually really good. You haven't had anything like this before. And then she was like, hmm okay, that's pretty good. And then the next day was like, can I try it again? Yeah, that's pretty good. And then like, she, and then and then the next day, she'd just like come up behind me at my desk and like sneak my cup and take a sip. And oh my God, that's too she cute. loved it, which then ultimately then she'd be like, hey, can you make me a cup of coffee? And I was like, Aww. I won. Ding, ding. <laughs> you, you brought her over to the dark side. I did, the literally, <laughs> yes, I brought her over to the dark side. That was exactly how I phrased it too. Um, and so that was a that was a great journey too, and it goes both ways. She's really gotten me into tea um, and appreciating that as well. So I got her onto that dark side, and um, yeah. And now I ended up, you know, I've actually um, explored. So then I'm like such a diehard coffee brand, and I'm going to give a shout out here. I saw um, advertisements for another coffee alternative, and for years I was like. Stop trying to make coffee alternatives, y'all. You cannot mess with God's juice. Leave it. It's perfect. I don't want to hear anymore. And See like, here. you know, yes, there's tons of health benefits. And yes, like it does something with your adenosine and it just covers up your tiredness. And I get that. And that's also a thing to, you know, the a lot of the energy you get is just because it's shutting off the thing that the, the adenosine. It's okay. It shut it off tired. all you want. Yeah. Shut, shut it off. Shut it off. Fine. Sure. You can also do a ton of other I'll things to like be balanced and healthy um you know and all that so there's so few vices jeremy right yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, there is I, there's a there's an audio clip that was trending um on you know instagram reels or whatever and it goes something like this this woman is like did you know that if you replace your morning cup of coffee with a nice hot cup of green tea that you can beat by that you can reduce by 87 percent your fucking will to live <laughs> <laughs> or something like the little fucking joy you have left in this world <laughs> like, you're not taking my joy <laughs> yeah you're not you're not so I don't even anyways like green tea. <laughs> yeah so i was like not interested in the alternatives but then this other brand uh everyday dose came around and um i love their branding and message and they're doing mushroom coffee coffee with lion's mane um, and chaga and a little bit of collagen and an amino acid profile and it's really high grade mushrooms and really good and just like slick marketing so I'm like all right I'll try and I tried it and it's actually really good and um, and I softened my stance and then I end up going on a retreat and I meet the owner Jack shout out to Jack um, and he's on this retreat sponsoring the retreat so we're having everyday dose in the morning um, and it does have a little bit of coffee in it. So if I didn't say that, it's it's one. Of, it's got about a third a cup, or like I forget how many milligrams of caffeine, um, and a great blend. And it, what's really great is it's a really easily blended powder that you just put in, 
Um, and so anyways, I've been enjoying the heck out of that. And so now I have a balance because I do, like I said, I'm an extreme and some days I'll have up to four cup of coffees. So now I have this everyday dose and I started doing it bulletproof and putting in, um, ghee and MCT oil and it is delicious. And I'll oh have God. one of those Sounds and so then good. it's really good. And then I'll savor my one, maybe two cups of coffee instead of, you know, throwing back four to get through the day or to stay alive. I mean, I always love it. Um, but it's helped, it's helped bring a little balance to me too. So if you're out there and you are interested in alternatives, if that's okay on this show. Of course, <laughs> absolutely. It's all, it's all welcome. Yeah, Trust great. me. Um, I, so, so everyday dose and, uh, you know, you can use my name for a little extra discount when you go on there too. They have different giveaways. So Jeremy Falk, um, will get you whatever offer they're sharing too, because I don't like plug a lot of stuff to be honest, but, um, met the owner, really stand by what they're doing and really enjoyed it. So, um, so I, I, I signed up for that to share with my, my community. So oh, cool. anyways, well, we can put I, that in the show notes. I'll put it in the show notes. Put it in the show go. notes. Um, yeah. yeah. Shout out to Jack and everyday dose. So now I have a balance and I have my little blended drink and then I have my just delicious Omix coffee and I'm a happy guy. That sounds so good. I, I love all of that. I try all of those things too. My my journey started with Dunkin' Donuts Light and Sweet, you know, on our way to high school. We yeah. would stop there. They didn't have drive through, like you would go in there and you would tell them, uh, you know, coffee, light and sweet, regular coffee, light and sweet, whatever. And they literally shoveled in the sugar. It was like a scooper, and they just were like, they literally were like, like the the whole thing there there was probably oh. a quarter cup of sugar in each cup it was like the most disgusting thing but like it was our first coffee so basically we were looking for coffee ice cream like i was saying before like we just there's putting the there's like no coffee like yeah yeah <laughs> do you, you know what i mean do you, do, would you like some coffee with your sugar right um and that's how i started out but um I mean, really drinking it, but I was first introduced to it from um, my grandparents and my my mother, which I said in a previous episode. Um, but it's very nostalgic for me. Like uh, when I was a little kid, my grandparents had these little candies called coffee nips, and they used to keep them in their pockets. And whenever I was with mm -hmm. them, I would go into their pockets to find these candies. And it wasn't it didn't even matter if they were coffee, right? Like, it, like if your grandparents had candy in their pockets, you're eating it. Like, it doesn't matter what totally. flavor it is. Yeah. Um, and that's my where grandpa I was had like, the root beer barrels. Okay, so you know what I'm talking. Like, you're first introduced to that, and you always have that ingrained in your memory. And when I was growing up, like whenever my mom made coffee in the morning, not every morning, but we would have in our cereal, she would put a couple teaspoons in it in the cereal milk. And so I was always getting a little taste mm. of it. Mm. Um, so I I grew up with it and I'm obsessed with my coffee. But like mm -hmm. you, I keep trying like all of these different iterations and coffee alternatives. Like I did the whole David Ospreay butter coffee with the collagen, the whole thing. My Vitamix was rolling every morning. Yeah. Um, and I also did... Um, not to to put down everyday dose because I haven't tried it yet, but I will. Um, <laughs> I was doing the Four Sigmatic was the one I was yep. introduced to that had the lion's mane chaga reishi with a little bit of coffee, or they did the chocolate one. And yep. so they're a great I, company too. Yeah, I think there's just there's a lot of good products out there now that are just you know testing and working in some similar flavor profiles. So like. I like that actually in the afternoon that feels a little bit more like a treat strangely mm -hmm. than like my coffee in the morning. I want it to be a little more pure and I don't yeah. want like a bunch of things going on. Yeah. I, I like the simplicity and the pureness of that. Um, but that's just me. Totally. But, yeah. yeah. Punch me in the face. Get me going. Big black cup. <laughs> <laughs> you know and then and then later yeah get the more balanced version with a little less caffeine and the dose has a lot of l-theanine so it's really balancing also so you you get this like really nice well-balanced energy um especially if you're going for a second or third cup yeah i did this uh episode called nappuccino have you heard of it no okay so i read about this daniel pink are you familiar with him uh -uh. he's he's a famous writer um okay. Uh, check him out. He does a lot of, you know, um, you know, like uh, self-help business type of books, that type of genre. Um, and 
he wrote about the nappuccino. So what you do is you have your cup of coffee and because it takes like 25 minutes for it to get through your bloodstream and to really mm -hmm. get like the heightened effects of the caffeine mm -hmm. that you have your cup of coffee and then you lay down for your 25, 30 minute power nap. And, you know, you lay down on the couch, you close the door, you shut off the phone, like really give yourself that time. And the power nap has so much, so many advantages to it, as we know, like that in and of itself is a really good um, uh, productivity hack, actually. Like it makes mm -hmm. you like more alert and, and more energy to get through the day. So you do that. And by the time you wake up, the caffeine is kicked in. And so you have like this beautiful balance of the the coffee kick you're looking for and the power nap. And it's yeah. called a nappuccino. Yeah. Thank you. I actually do remember. I, I did, I did know this. I forgot that was the name. So yeah, that, that is good. I, I, I think I may have tried it once. Um, I'm not a huge napper. I, it, for me, um, it's hard for me to go down and come back up again. Um, I know there's a lot of benefits and works well for some people. Um, but I haven't, I haven't done that one a lot. What I do, I don't have a cool name for it. Let's see. Yeah, I'm not gonna have a nail. <laughs> but, um, we'll I have make my, one up. Uh, we can make one up. So if you can find of, of, a, of a coffee drink name. So I have a foot massager, little foot massager device. And so some mornings I'll just sit on the couch with my feet in the foot massager. And that's my 15 minute, just like be calm while I drink my coffee instead of just go running around doing, you know, something else or scrolling or getting into emails and drinking. If I just want a nice moment to like rest and drink my coffee, it's my 15 minute foot massage. So I love but that. I'm not Chino sure. Doesn't have the same ring. Yeah, no. Can. And and bringing yeah. like feet and coffee in, I'm I just cannot see the connection. Yeah, and you definitely don't want to say foot latte either. Yeah, yeah no, I think we not... need to let that one go. Let and that just one go. Say that you did a foot massage right. and you had your coffee. That's that's a good route. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can't Brangelina that one. We can't, no, yeah, we can't yeah. It. You're you're probably right. You're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god too funny too funny you could say soul coffee maybe get it oh um, wait a minute that's a little better. oh that See, there's always really, a way <laughs> that is actually pretty good we we do you want to hashtag that i think you should grab that Mas while you can hashtag soul massage your souls drink your coffee oops excuse me soul yep. coffee <laughs> brought to you by jeremy fault so yeah <laughs> so tell me jeremy um as we wind down our podcast, I wanted to find out what's next for you, what you're working on, maybe what you'd like to share with my mm. coffee culture family. We're, we're heard in over 105 countries. So Beautiful. maybe somebody will want to join your men's retreat. So if you want to share, I think I saw on Instagram, you had one coming up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, right now. So I, you know, I just started um, with a good brother of mine, Nick, a monthly men's circle in San Francisco. Um, so if you're in the Bay area and in San Francisco, we're gathering um, on second Wednesdays and we can leave this in the show notes too, um, at a beautiful spot called the center SF, uh, a great community um, and uh, tea house. Unfortunately, they are not serving coffee, but I still really love them. And they're a great place. We won't hold so it the, against them. We won't hold them against them. Just a them. little. And uh, a tiny a tiny bit, yeah. Tiny tiny. Um, but they do have cacao. That's a good, that's a good stand-in. Okay. And um, anyway, so we have the monthly men's circle there, and we're growing this great community of guys that are gathering, and we're gonna start to um, have some really nice outdoor hikes and men's retreats that are growing from from this community as well. Um, so that's a great offering. And yeah, I do I do a couple of yoga retreats a year also. The next one is coming up in Mendocino, um, just two and a half hours north of San Francisco. I usually do them all over and um, we just did one in Mexico for New Year's. So I haven't done a local one in a while for me. Um, so we'll be in May, uh, May 18th to the 21st. We'll be in Mendocino at this beautiful property that has glamping tents and cabins and houses, so all different ranges. Um, for people's comforts, incredible food, saltwater pool. It's on a river um, and there's hiking trails all around. It's just gorgeous, Heaven. majestic Northern California. Um, it's a Thursday to Sunday retreat. So just a long weekend, a little more accessible. And we do, yoga, we, you know, we meditate every morning um, and we do, you know, I teach, I teach mostly vinyasa yoga. And so we'll, we'll do vinyasa yoga and, and get into our bodies and chances to connect and drop in and meet people and also 
um, chances to be in solitude and read your book and take a nap or have a nappuccino out in the park uh, or under some trees or near the redwoods or something too. So that retreat's coming up in May. um, And, you know, I usually have a few a year. So uh, staying in touch on my website or the Instagram, Jeremy Falk Yoga uh, is always a good place to hear about things that are happening next. Um, and I also just recently started working with um, this really cool modality. It's called Kama Flight, and it's super interesting. It's a it's a partner dance. It's somewhere between Thai massage, contact improv dance, um, and acro yoga. If you're familiar with acro yoga, mm-hmm. where you're kind of a base and a flyer, um, but it's a little more participatory from both people, and it's this beautiful dance uh, where the base. Uh, is like stretching their partner, moving them around, putting them up to fly, but taking them down and, you know, bringing their legs and shoulders across the body. It's done on the edge of a massage table. It's this really, um, you know, beautiful um, dance. And I got to go to the retreat um, recently and um, it was their first one of this guy who was creating this new modality. So now I'm involved. I saw a lot of ways where I could help support as a, a teacher um, an embodiment teacher and someone who leads teacher trainings, especially in sequencing, uh, I reached out and I was like, I think I can help you teach this um, in a really impactful way that lands with people. Let's break it down. Let's sequence it. Let's give it names. Da, da, da. So now I'm working with him and there'll be some comma flight retreats um, as well. It's a, it's a really cool dance of the masculine and feminine. Um, of course, energies that we all carry. So this doesn't mean it's a man, woman, partner, but for any um, two people who want to heal Uh, through intimacy and touch and connection and play with the polarities of the masculine and feminine energies that we all carry. Um, There's a lot going here in this practice. So I'll be sharing more about that too um, as well. Wow. That is totally incredible. I Mm. I love that. And um, I might have to have you back on for that so you can, when that comes into fruition. Um, I, I have taken classes. Um, I'm not a dancer. Let me just first say that. And I had a yoga practice for a long time, which has fallen down. So I, I had, I need to get that back up, but I used to live mm, in cool. an area in Connecticut that had two modern dance companies. One was called Palabolus and the other was called Momix. And I don't know if you've mm-hmm. heard of either one, but, mm. um, behind me, like, I'm going to try and angle this. Can you see this picture, which is kind of what you're talking about oh. in terms of that balance. Can you see Yeah. It? Yeah, totally. It's beautiful. So it's a modern dance troupe and they do a lot of balancing and moving and holding each other up. And I actually took one of the classes and it was so inspiring. And the energy that you get from like leaning and positioning yourself against other people, it, it was otherworldly. Like, I mean, I wasn't there with a partner. I was just in a room full of st- not strangers, people in my community. And it was amazing, like holding each other up and balancing each other, the the whole experience. So I look forward to hearing what you, what actually comes together with all of that. So we'll have to meet up after. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Super cool. Jeremy, thank you for coming on Coffee Culture. This was really awesome. I liked having you. My pleasure, Holly. Thanks. Me too. It was a great time. And you'll send me all the links and I'll put them in the show notes for everybody. Great. This is great. That was a wrap. We did it. Cool. (laughs) We did it. (laughs) We did it. That was so fun. Thank you so much. Share your thoughts and ideas on coffee culture. You could put them in the reviews on Apple Podcasts or DM me on Instagram. And if you'd like to support an indie podcaster, there is a link in the show notes for buying me a coffee. Please subscribe and share a cup of coffee culture with your friends. This season is produced by Pale Blue Studios.